Thank you. I'm honoured to be with you. Susan, Fred, delegates, congratulations. I've watched your Congress from Turkey where I was uh, during the week through your updates and I'm proudly able to say the EI is my home. Your work, your values, your solidarity on display this week are so vital for the just world that we demand. He's a Syrian refugee seeking refuge in Turkey. He's 14. His father died and he left school to go to work to support his mother and sister in Aleppo when he was just 10. He can't read or write proficiently, but even though he fled from the bombs just a year ago, he is optimistic for the future because an incredible Turkish family gave him a job and an extended family. He has a natural skill with horses and he helps on a horse ranch high in the mountains of Cappadocia. The Turkish delegates here can be very proud of the compassion and the solidarity of their people when the grandfather tells me, of course they can come. They are human beings. We can share a little food and clothing and find some work for those who want to live with us in our village. This young man, he says, is gold and we welcome him. When you ask a fellow refugee, Yusuf, when I was privileged to talk to these people on just Thursday afternoon, what must change? He says the bombs must stop and Assad must go. Hussein should be in school, and your condemnation on the lack of political will to fund schools in Syria is a call that must be heard. You will be amused when you know that Hussein was very anxious about this lady asking him all these questions about school. He thought fearfully that I might be there to take him back to the classroom. Work is better, he says, and I can help my family. Indeed, the right to schooling and the dignity of work is central to our lives. With our Turkish unions this week, who themselves are the victims of terrorist violence, we demanded that the right to work be respected with all the associated labour rights for migrants. We have the worst refugee crisis since World War II and the world is silent about it, except for a growing xenophobia from our government. And ironically, 80% of these refugees are in developing countries, yet I'm ashamed to say it is the wealthy nations, including my own, who deny refugees and asylum seekers the dignity of rights and the optimism to live without fear of deportation amongst us. Colleagues, the fundamental freedoms of peace, democracy, freedom of association, labour rights, decent work, free education, and social protection are slipping away in too many parts of the world. You have named these atrocities this week and you will stand with union men and women and their families and communities to turn back the rising tide of authoritarianism, of corporate greed and of privatisation of education. And you will fight as you have always done for freedom of association. It is shocking for me to see again the threats against the KTU, the anti-union legislation in Canada and the UK and much more. But you have and will fight back for the rights of teachers, indeed all education workers. So what is truly shocking is to witness the rape of our taxes to feed the escalating wealth of the corporate giants whose quest for profits are endless. This week alone we have seen Amazon the CEO that the ITUC Congress voted the worst CEO in the world just last year, become wealthier than Walmart. And indeed, we know that the Walmart family, the Waltons, own around $2 trillion about the GDP of Canada. Innocent booksellers, Amazon are not. And then Pearson's. I believe you know this company. I've heard it occasionally from Angelo or David or Fred or Susan. But indeed, you know that just this week they've declared they have a war chest of almost $2 billion to, quote, focus on education. 
Well, the greed of for-profit schools has no place in a just world. You need to know that the global union movement is with you and parents and communities will be with you as well. When you look at Ghana and you see children forced to work to pay their school fees, with fear that if they don't pay their fees because their families can't afford them, that they'll not be allowed education. This is not acceptable, not on our watch. And these stories are everywhere. Every child has a right to universal, free, quality education. And indeed, the, uh, when Pearsons or their ilk try to milk our taxpayers, then they need to know that if they deprive our children of their right to free education, then they will pay the electoral penalty. Building workers' power is the mandate of the ITC, and this campaign against Pearsons is an organising campaign like no other. The ITUC is indeed determined to tame corporate power in all of its uh, shapes and sizes. And our umbrella campaign being built in Asia as we speak, extended to Africa and Latin America in 2016, has a banner of end corporate greed. Together, we can do that. But colleagues, there's a lot to do. Let me introduce you to the global workforce. There are around 2.9 billion workers in the global workforce. Only 60% of them have a formal job, and even then, the majority of those workers are in precarious, increasingly precarious work. Then there are 40% of our brothers and sisters struggling in the informal economy, with no minimum wage, no social protection, and excluded from the legislative labour rights that others enjoy. These numbers in the informal economy are growing. And we have around 30 million of our brothers and sisters enslaved in forced labour, modern day slavery. We called it modern day slavery, and the world now accepts that in fact it is just that. So when you know that that's the global workforce, and the wage share of national wealth keeps falling in almost all nations over the last 30 years, while CEO pay in countries has risen by up to 90 times that of a typical worker, then something is very wrong with this global economic model. When we know that 75% of the world's people have no or inadequate social protection, and the social protection floor costs just a few percentage points of GDP, why is it that our taxpayers, uh, that our tax dollars are not being used for the public services and support for which we pay them, and that the tax evasion of corporations is encouraged or tolerated by too many governments? It's time for change. Inequality is a matter of political choice, nationally and internationally, and it is fueled by the dominant model of global trade, corporate greed. You know, the biggest companies of the world depend on supply chains that are so exploitative now that low, wage, low wages, unsafe and insecure work have become the business model. The, uh, when our corporations can't pay a minimum wage of $177 a month in Cambodia or $250 a month in Jakarta or $120 in Bangladesh or pick a country in another region and I can give you the union demands, then something is very wrong. When a textile worker like Rina, who I met just a month ago in the Philippines, tells me when you ask her what would change her life, that if we just stop the company forcing her to do overtime so that she could tell her 12-year-old son, for whom she's worried about his safety, whether she would be able to cook him a meal at night or say goodnight to him because she doesn't know when she'll be home, 10, 12, 2, 4 in the morning, sometimes without food because the canteen doesn't open till 6, then something is very wrong. Or when men gathering seafood for many of our tables are enslaved on boats in Indonesian waters without living quarters or sanitation facilities for months on end, and there is no hope 
for decent work, then they need us. They need union. They need solidarity. And you know the story of slavery in Qatar and the deep corruption of FIFA and all the construction and service companies shamefully making a profit from the World Cup in a slave state. Well, next week, I will stand with some of your members. Some of them are artists, some of them are professors. And indeed, we will launch the Gold Labor Report. And we will say to the world that in fact, Guggenheim, the Louvre, New York University, other colleges, you cannot build and operate in slave states and expect us not to target you. Likewise, be warned other institutions.
as well as gender inequality, and gender equality are central to our future. But the challenge for all of us will be to defend them and see them implemented. So I can't leave you, brothers and sisters, without a word on climate. For the destruction of our lives and livelihoods is staring us in the face. We say there are no jobs on a dead planet. And this, frankly, is much more than a slogan. For we're already witnessing the loss of livelihoods, indeed lives, with the tragedy of increasing weather events, the extremities of those events, and indeed the changing of seasons for many communities. So indeed, as our governments gather in Paris in just a few months' time, we need to tell them that their ambitions are too low, that their commitments will not save the planet. The challenge to decarbonise our world is a task for all of us. Government ambition is too low, and there's no country, not one country on the planet, not one industry sector that has a collective agreement or a social compact with unions, indeed for the transition that is imperative. And the time for planning for a just transition is running out. I hope to see some of you at our Paris summit, uh, climate summit in September. We are committed as a global movement to zero carbon, zero poverty by 2050. And we have a right to know what governments and employers will do to enact change to protect and grow clean energy jobs, and we have a right to know where our pension funds are invested so that they drive the imperative industri of industrial transformation. And we have a right to know that there's a plan for those workers who built the prosperity of today, the coal miners and the miners in our oil industries. They must not be the victims. We need to end coal. We need to end fossil fuels. But I say our children will work in energy, they just won't work with these technologies. And we, we demand the just transition for those workers and their communities. So finally, let me leave you with this message of solidarity. Teachers, all education workers have rights. Our children have the right to education, but the profit motive has no place in dictating what is taught or how it is taught or how it is assessed or how your schools are organised. We will support you to put Pearson's out of business, out of your business, solidarity.